you've probably taken a blurry photo before, we all have. But do you know why it was blurry? We're going to talk about the different types of blur, how to identify what they are, and what you can do to prevent them. There are five common types of blur that you'll encounter in your images. There's camera shake, motion blur, out of focus images, panning blur, and blur caused from image stabilization. Let's start by talking about camera shake. One of the easiest ways to prevent camera shake is to develop a proper hand holding technique. Now, a lot of people don't hold their cameras properly when they take a photo. So I'll show you what I mean. If you've used a point and shoot camera or maybe you use a live, live view screen on the back of your DSLR, you might hold the camera out here and compose using the screen. Now, that's fine for composition purposes, but you're out here, you actually have a lot higher potential for camera shake because your arms just get tired and can't hold the camera nearly as steady. So, one thing you can do is use the viewfinder when you're composing your images or when you actually take the image. Another thing that people will do is they will stand parallel to their subject. So say, for example, I'm gonna take a picture of this tree that's over here. I don't wanna stay and stand like this. Right now, I'm actually set up to take a picture of this flower and instead of being parallel to it, I'm not facing it, I'm perpendicular to it. So my body is pretty much at a right angle to this flower. So if I'm gonna take a picture of this, I'm gonna turn like this. What that does, it gives me a wider base compared to the flower, so my feet are actually really stable. Another thing that you'll wanna do is not hold your elbows out here. So I'm not gonna hold my elbows like this and take a picture, I'm gonna push them into my body. So what that does, again, is it, it stabilizes your camera with your elbows and your body so that you have one solid base that's keeping your camera stable. So more like this, less like this. Where you put your hand is also really important. Some people hold their camera like this. Some people might hold their lens like way out here if it's a big telephoto. One of the best places you can put your camera is it actually, you'll feel a little bit of balance. So if I put my, my hand out here, it's not balanced. If I put my hand here, it's not balanced. Right under here, I can feel that the camera's really balanced. That's about the best place that you can hold your lens. So let's do a quick recap. I've got my feet perpendicular to my subject. I have my elbows pushed into my side. I have my hand under my camera and my lens where it's balanced. I have my camera up to my face. Now, the last thing, when you put your camera to your face, you can actually push it against your head a little bit or push your head against your camera. That gives you a little bit of resistance and pressure there, which adds just a little bit more stabilization. So when you combine all three, it's gonna look something like this. I'm gonna be able to take a really solid, steady photo and hopefully not have camera shake because of how I held my camera. Another technique to reduce camera shake is called the Joe McNally grip. Well, simply because Joe McNally popularized it. The whole idea is to use a camera to rest on your shoulder simply because your shoulder is going to be typically more stable than your hands. So for this to work though, you need a higher profile camera. So if you have a camera like this, I've got the Fuji X-T1 or a regular DSLR camera, you would need the battery grip just because your shoulder is so much lower. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply place the battery grip on the left shoulder like this, tuck my hand right hand in, and then use my left hand to support. So for this, I'm gonna have to now use my left eye to look through the viewfinder. It might feel awkward a little bit, but it really works, so try it out. So once again, just like this, or facing front, and that's it. Now there's a separate technique for hand holding really long lenses. So in this case, I have a 7200. It's not a super long lens, but it's big and it's heavy, and it has a tripod foot. So I've seen photographers do this, try to photograph. Now you can see that it's really not stable when you go like this. So try, if you have a tripod leg on the lens, try not to hold the tripod leg. Simply move it to the top or just detach it. If you don't use it on a tripod, just detach it. And now you can actually hold the lens. Now this is the important part. You don't want to hold the body. I've seen a lot of photographers go like this. Now, the cameras are really good and the mount points are strong, but one thing you have to keep in mind, if you consistently use your camera with a big lens like this and you just let it go, then your mount is getting a lot of stress because the lens is so much heavier than the camera. 
So all that stress is, is on the mount. Eventually, you might either damage the mount or it's going to be tilted. If it tilts, then you're going to have a lot of blurry pictures. And you could have a, the worst I've seen is one picture looks sharp on the top and really blurry in the bottom. And that potentially can happen just because of the mount if it goes at the particular angle. So the best way to handhold this is you want to handhold by the lens. That's where all that weight falls. And if you put it on your hand like this, you can actually see where it balances the most. So you don't want to hold it here because it's too much back balance or too much closer to the, to the camera because it's now front balance. So find a point where it's a good point of balance. And then same technique, you want to be pushing the camera really close to your body with your hands tucked in, one of the feet on the front, and push this close. And you're ready to take a picture. I just talked about how a heavy lens like the 7200 can put a lot of stress on the lens mount. And I want to talk about how to properly mount it on a tripod. Now, like I said, it's a very heavy lens, so you don't want to put all that stress on the camera body. And there is a reason why there is a tripod foot like this. So when you mount, make sure even though you might have a plate on the camera, you never want to mount the camera like this so that all that pressure and the stress is on the camera. So what you want to do is mount it properly on the foot just like this. So now that you know how to hold your camera, let's talk about why you get camera shake in the first place. Mainly it has to do with the shutter speed. Now you can have the best hand holding technique and you can still have camera shake or you can have really poor hand holding technique and not have camera shake. Ultimately shutter speed is what determines if there's camera shake in your image or not. Now with camera shake it happens because your shutter speed is too low and your camera's moving a little bit. Tripods don't really give you camera shake because they keep your camera nice and steady but hand holding we're humans, we move. The wind might blow, our feet might be tired, our camera might be heavy. Somehow this camera is going to move a little bit when we take a photo. If you try and hand hold for say one second, chances are that is going to have some camera shake in it because you just cannot hold the camera rock steady for one second. On the flip side, if you shoot at say a four thousandth of a second, chances are that's going to be a pretty sharp photo with no camera shake at least because that that camera or that shutter speed relative to just any little movement that you might have in the camera is going to be negated so you're just going to like freeze the action with such a fast shutter speed so earlier i was taking some test shots of this flower back here now i took a photo and there wasn't enough of the flower in focus so i uh, increased my aperture to get more depth of field but what happened was i had to actually drop my shutter speed and use a slower shutter speed to let in more light. When I did that, I got a blurry photo because I was shooting at too low of a, of a shutter speed and I just couldn't hold the camera steady enough. So right now I'm at f5.6, 250th of a second, and I had to crank my ISO up to 400 instead of maybe a 200 or 100, which I would have preferred, just so that I have a fast enough shutter speed and enough depth of field to take a good photo of this flower. When I shot that earlier photo that had camera shake in it, I was shooting at 1 60th of a second. Now you might say, well, I've shot at a 60th of a second before and I haven't had camera shake. Well, it depends on what lens and what camera you're using and something called the reciprocal rule. Right now, I'm shooting with a D7100 and that has a crop sensor in it. I'm shooting with the 85 millimeter lens. Now, the equivalent lens or equivalent focal length on this crop sensor of an 85 millimeter lens is close to 125 millimeters. So what the reciprocal rule is, is I want to make sure that I'm shooting at one over whatever my focal length is. With this, the equivalent focal length is 125 millimeters. So I wanna make sure I'm shooting at at least one 125th of a second. One 60th of a second was just too slow to prevent camera shake from happening in my photo. Now it's possible, but it's a lot easier if you shoot over that it gives you a much greater chance of having a stable photo. So that's why I'm shooting at one two fiftieth of a second. It's twice as fast as I technically need to shoot with this lens and body combination. Now two more things to add to this conversation about camera shake. First, the reciprocal rule is not set in stone. 
it's just really a reference. Some people have very steady hands, some people have really shaky hands. So the reciprocal rule is really just a reference to help you figure out about what shutter speed or about what minimum shutter speed you'll want to shoot at. Now, the other thing is image stabilization. A lens, you'll out often see in the references to the lens, will say that it has up to two to three stops of image stabilization. Now, with that, that will actually let you hand hold at a lower shutter speed than the reciprocal rule tells you you should be able to. So if this, Im if this lens had image stabilization of two stops, I could actually probably hand hold it to take a picture of that flower and get a steady shot without any kind of camera shake. Not guaranteed, but it's very possible. Let's talk about one hand holding technique that might really actually help you with reducing camera shake when you're working in the field. Well, I have John here with me and I'm photographing here in kind of a shaded area. What I'm gonna do is I'm simply going to lean against the tree and take a shot. So I have my hand stuck in and leaning nicely here. All right, well, the image is looking nice and sharp. So that's something for you to keep in mind when you're out shooting next time. If you have a similar situation, you're especially shooting with a portrait lens and you don't want to be rocking back and forth or potentially introducing camera shake just because your shutter speeds are too low, just find something stable that you can lean against. It could be a tree, it could be a car that's parked, it could be really anything like a wall. Just keep that in mind. Now, even if you have the most stable hands in the world or even if you're using a tripod, if your subject is moving, you're still have potential for blur. And that's actually not camera shake, that's gonna be called motion blur. Motion blur occurs when you're using a shutter speed that isn't fast enough to freeze the action of a moving subject. So, there's lots of different types of moving subjects. You might have a person walking by or maybe even leaves blowing in the wind. A shutter speed of say a 30th of a second might actually not be fast enough to freeze that and you'll see a little bit of blur. So even if you have a really solid hand-holding technique and the camera isn't shaking, your subject is moving and it's not getting frozen in that image. Now with fast-moving subjects, you might have a bird that's taking off or a car that's driving by and you want to shoot at say 500th or 1,000th of a second, but sometimes even that might not be fast enough. The real trick here is that there isn't a hard and fast rule about what type of motion requires what type of shutter speed. So, Make sure that you shoot with a fast enough shutter speed relative to the motion of your subject to freeze it, you'll have a sharp image every time. So now that you've learned the reciprocal rule, you know how to handhold your camera, you can freeze your subject in motion, you need to make sure that you actually attain proper focus. So that's what we're going to talk about here is focusing in images so you don't have blur from focus issues. So with focus, the first thing you need to figure out is what you want to focus on and where on your subject you want to focus. So with a person, for example, you typically focus on the closest eye. On a flower, you might want to focus right in the center, and on a landscape, you might end up focused at infinity on the farthest part of your frame. Now, one thing about subjects is if they're able to move, you want to make sure that once you've acquired focus, your subject doesn't move. With a person, that's very likely that even if they're sitting still, they might rock back and forth a bit, and where you had focused on their eye, it might now be completely out of focus. The same goes for you as the photographer. If you've attained focus and you tend to move a little bit, what you had focused on is actually going to be out of focus. So make sure that you choose a steady subject, that you yourself as the photographer stay steady, and that point that you focused on will still be in focus when you take the picture. Now I mentioned a little bit of movement from either your subject or yourself can move your subject out of focus. Why is that? Well, if you're photographing a subject that's very close to you, and maybe you're shooting at f1.4 or f2 for the aperture, when they move just a little bit, they have moved out of that depth of field and they're going to be out of focus. On the other hand, if you're shooting at something or someone that's farther away, and maybe they're at an aperture of f8, then they are gonna be within the depth of field even if there is a little bit of motion. So, just something to know, something to consider the next time you're out taking photos. Another creative use for shutter speed is to actually use a slow shutter speed and pan. Now, panning is basically moving your camera at the same speed as a moving subject. What that does, it gives you a blurry background from motion blur while your subject stays sharp and in focus. So there's a few different ways to do this and a few different camera settings you'll need to make sure that you've got. So 
first off, you'll probably want a slow shutter speed for most subjects. If you're photographing a race car or something that's moving really fast, a faster shutter speed will work. But for example, Melissa on a bicycle, we're gonna want a slow shutter speed. I'm at a 10th of a second. I drop my ISO all the way down as far as it'll go. I'm at ISO 64 and my aperture I have bumped up to F10. So if that's still not enough, if it's still gonna be too bright because it's slow shutter speeds in lots of light, you're gonna need something else to help restrict the amount of light coming into your camera. You can use a filter, uh, specifically a neutral density filter. So just be aware, these are great to have in your bag if you ever wanna cut out extra light from coming into your camera. So what we're gonna do, like I said, I'm gonna have Melissa ride her bike. I'm gonna track, track her riding the bike at the same speed and we'll see what we get. So again, this is called panning. So let's go ahead and see how this works. Melissa, go ahead and take a ride. Okay, so let's take a look. Those look great. The background is blurry. She's in focus. That's what panning is. One more thing. When photographing moving subjects, whether you're panning or whether the subject is just moving and you're not panning, a continuous focus mode is going to give you the best results simply because the distance between you and your subject might change. So in this example, I was using a continuous focusing mode. You can also use a continuous shutter release mode, which will give you just that burst of images without having to push the shutter button every single time. One thing to note, panning is intentional. Other types of blur, you probably don't want them. Panning is something that you do on purpose, specifically for the result. The last type of blur that you might come across is actually caused by image stabilization. Now you know image stabilization is designed to help reduce camera shake, but if you have it turned on on your lens or in your camera body and you have your camera on a tripod, it can actually introduce blur into an image. So why does that happen? Well, it sounds like it shouldn't, but there's really a simple reason why it does. When you have your camera mounted on a tripod and you have image stabilization turned on in your lens or in your body, it's trying to compensate for motion that's not there. Your camera's standing still, but the internal components are moving around trying to look for this motion and they're actually introducing blur into the image that shouldn't be there in the first place. So make sure that when you have your camera on a tripod, you turn off image stabilization both in the lens and the body if you have it. Now let's take everything that we've learned about blur and see if we can get a good sharp photo. If you remember earlier, I was standing over by the bush with the flowers on it. I went ahead and took a photo and here's everything that went through my head before I pressed the shutter. First, I made sure I had good hand-holding technique. So, camera to the face, elbows tucked in, standing perpendicular to my flower. Second, I thought about the reciprocal rule. So I made sure with this lens camera combination that I needed to be at least above 1 1 25th of a second, which I was. Third, there wasn't really any wind, so I didn't have to worry about a lot of motion blur within the frame itself. My subject wasn't moving. Next, I wasn't panning, so we didn't have to worry about anything like that. But as far as focus goes, I did need to make sure that I focused in the center of the flower. I was shooting at f5.6, so I knew most of the flower would be in focus, but I still had to make sure that I got a good focus and didn't actually move once I attained focus. Finally, I don't have image stabilization in this lens or this body. If I was shooting handheld, I would probably turn them on, but if I had this on a tripod, I would definitely turn them off. Now, let's take a look at the photo and see how I did. So the whole point of this was to get a sharp photo without any blur. You can see here, the flower, which is my subject, is nice and in focus, while the background has a really soft focus, which makes the flower stand out. The water drops are sharp, there's no motion blur, no camera shake. I think this was a success.